Thank you for joining me on Primetime News. I'm Diana Kauta, and for the next 20 odd minutes, we'll be exploring the latest local, continental, and global news. Our leading story tonight centers around a crucial demand for legislative transformation. Chairperson of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Economics and Public Administration, Natangwe Ithete, has ignited a discussion on the pressing need to review laws and update acts to better align with the changing dynamics of the Namibian society. Speaking at a recent workshop, Ithete emphasized the significance of replacing outdated acts that no longer serve their purpose. Our reporter, Isabel Bento, has the details on this important story. Gazetted in 2021, the Financial Institutions and Markets Act aimed to replace the outdated Pension Fund Act of 1956 with the aims to reform, consolidate and harmonize the laws that govern non-bank financial institutions, financial intermediaries and financial markets while addressing flaws identified in the current outdated legislation. Making reference to the FEMA Act, Chairperson of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Economics and Public Administration, Natangwe Ifete, said, The country finds itself sitting with a Pension Fund Act gazetted in 1956, an act which no longer suits the current economic situation. Ifete shared these remarks at the FEMA consultation workshop in the Irongo region. The workshop brings together representatives from various stakeholders, such as the Namibia Financial Institution Supervisory Authority, Finance Ministry and Pension Funds. The workshop will also provide a platform for members of parliament and stakeholders to share their views, experiences and recommendations on the proposed pension preservation clause and other provisions of FEMA. According to Ithete, the outcomes of the three-day workshop will inform the Economics Committee of the National Assembly of Namibia on the way forward. In our next report, we turn our attention to the critical issue of water supply in Namibia. Minister of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform, Kale Schledwein, has issued a directive to the newly appointed Namwater board members, urging them to prioritize the timely execution of capital projects aimed at ensuring a sustainable water supply for every Namibian. We now delve deeper into the minister's directive and the significance of these water projects for the future of Namibia. Speaking during the inauguration ceremony of the seven board members on Monday, Schletwein said they have a pivotal role to timely implement the government's six key capital water projects under the Water Sector Support Program during their three-year period of serving. The projects include new purification plants in Rundu in the Kavango East region, Katima Mulilo and Oshakati in Oshana region, plus rehabilitation work on the Omahenene to Oshakati Canal and rerouting of the canal around Oshikuku settlement in the Omusati region. Equally, it includes the rehabilitation work on pipelines supplying rural communities including the Ondangwa to Omutseronime pipeline and Orongo Oshakati pipeline, the rehabilitation of the pipeline between Naute and Kietmanshoop in the Karas region, as well as the rehabilitation of pipelines in the central coastal area. The new board members are Chairperson Luther Rika, Vice Chair Maenge Shipiki Kali, Vivian Kingaya, Francis Hionis, Uda Nakamela, Fanuel Uwanga, and Meti Hawanga. In a powerful address today at the Pan African Parliament Workshop in South Africa, the leader of the popular democratic movement, McHenry Venani, underscored a crucial aspect for the success of the African continental free trade area. Venani emphasized that unless African countries prioritize the growth and empowerment of the continent's small and medium enterprises and reduce dependency on major foreign companies such as those from China, the realization of the free trade agreement remains uncertain. Take a listen. For as long as we are giving all our major procurement tenders to Chinese companies on the African continent, how do we empower African businesses that are in Africa for them to be able to compete on the African continent if every procurement that we have, major breaches, dams, are built by Chinese and other multinational companies? So if we are not empowering our own companies in our own countries, 
making sure that we strengthen the basis of our SMEs, can we really have a continental free trade area while we have not empowered the companies that we have in our own, in our own, on our own soil? The other issue that is quite very important to me is the fact that parliamentarians only talk about this matter at this for us. When we go to our domestic parliaments, I've never had a workshop in a village discussing Africa continental free trade area. We are saying we want to take the youth along. Which youth are we taking the, uh, along? The unemployed youth? The underemployed youth? And how do we engage the youth for them to be ready to be able to partake? And I think as parliamentarians, we must start fundamentally with the question of information mobilization. Our people should know what we know. In a tragic incident, a heartbreaking accident unfolded in Vanduk's Academia residential area over the weekend. A toddler lost their life in a drowning incident that occurred in a residential swimming pool on Sunday. Now, we bring you a detailed report on this unfortunate incident. The Namibian police force in a crime report said the girl, aged 2 years and 10 months, was in the care of her father and grandmother after they had fetched her from her mother's house. According to the police report, she was playing outside with two other children, aged 4 and 7, when the incident occurred. The toddler's body was found floating under the pool cover. Police investigations continue. In an unrelated incident in the Kavango West region, a 29-year-old man was arrested for allegedly stabbing another man to death. The incident occurred at Kangenya Liquor Store in Kurenkuru. According to the police, the suspect stabbed the 25-year-old victim in the chest with an okapi knife and he died on the spot. It is not clear what caused the fight. The next of kin of the deceased have been informed and police investigations into the matter continue. Our hearts go out to the family affected by this devastating event. Your top roundup is next. Welcome to Primetime Biz, your comprehensive source of in-depth analysis for the latest news and trends shaping the dynamic world of business and economics. Now, in a significant step towards fostering collaboration and synergy in the realm of competition law and policy, the Namibian Competition Commission has recently signed a memorandum of understanding with the Botswana Competition and Consumer Authority. This agreement serves to formalize and strengthen the cooperative framework between the two entities in the domains of competition law, enforcement and policy. The process of uh, clearing the MOU through the office of the Attorney General here in Namibia and in Botswana have now been completed. As I said earlier, today marks an important day in which the two authorities uh, formalize the cooperation arrangement by way of signing the Memorandum of Understanding. 
The, the purpose of uh, this memorandum of understanding, as contained in Article 2, is to contribute to effective enforcement of the competition law in Botswana and in Namibia through the establishment of a framework for cooperation between the two competition authorities. Um, in the context of uh, this MOU, the competition authorities will promote uh, competition issues by addressing anti-competitive conduct in, their, in accordance with the laws and regulations of our respective countries in order to facilitate the development and cooperation of well-functioning markets um, in our countries. The competition authorities will cooperate with and provide assistance to each other to the extent consistent with the laws and regulations of our countries. In the latest report from Sirius Capital, new car sales in April 2023 reached a total of 1,004 units, showcasing a remarkable 10% year-on-year increase. However, this positive trend was accompanied by an 18.1% monthly decline, signaling a shift in market dynamics. Shelfer Wells filed this report. While this is fewer than the 1,226 units sold in March 2023 and the 1,103 units sold in February 2023, it is the third month in a row that new vehicle sales have surpassed 1,000 units, with commercial vehicle sales outnumbering passenger vehicle sales by 68 units. The vehicle report states that for the second month in a row, commercial vehicles dominated new vehicle sales, which increased by 22.1% year-on-year but fell by 17.7% month-on-month. Passenger vehicle sales increased by 0.4% year-on-year but fell 18.6% month-on-month. It also reported that rental agencies purchased 52 units, a considerable decrease from the 113 units purchased in March, and that 37 of the 52 rental units were passenger vehicles, with the remaining 15 units being light commercial vehicles. According to the report, new car sales are off to a great start this year, despite the challenges of much higher borrowing rates and continuous vehicle price increases. This, according to the report, is especially surprising given the difficulty consumers encounter in acquiring auto financing due to affordability issues. That brings us to the end of our top news segment for tonight. Stay tuned for the Economics Roundup, followed by a detailed weather forecast.
commence our Sport Planet segment with an exciting announcement for cricket fans. Uganda has been chosen by the International Cricket Council, ICC, to host the final round of the ICC Women's T20 World Cup qualifiers for the African region. This prestigious event, confirmed by Alan Mugume, the Chief Executive Officer of the Uganda Cricket Association, promises to be a thrilling showcase of talent. Set to unfold at the Lugogo Cricket Oval in Kampala, the tournament is scheduled to take place from the 7th to the 18th of December. Eight teams, including the host nation Uganda, along with Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Rwanda, Nigeria, Namibia, and two additional teams to qualify from the Division II qualifiers in Botswana in October, will compete for the ultimate honor. On to football news. Juventus has been hit with a significant blow to their Serie A campaign. On Monday, the Italian Football Federation's appeals court revised Juventus' initial 15-point penalty for illicit transfer activity imposing a harsh 10-point deduction on the club. This latest sanction deals a severe blow to Juventus' aspiration of securing a spot in the highly coveted Champions League next season. With only two matches remaining this season, the deduction pushes them out of the top four, jeopardizing their remarkable streak of 11 consecutive seasons in Europe's premier competition dating back to 2012. Your Sports Roundup is next. And that brings us to the conclusion of tonight's broadcast. We sincerely appreciate your viewership. Be sure to join us again tomorrow as we continue to bring you the most recent updates on local, continental and global news. On behalf of myself, Diana Kauta, and the entire dedicated production team working tirelessly behind the scenes, it's a good night.